Had a great Sunday school hour again. All right. Come on in, get a seat. We're just going to start again this morning by reading from Psalm 29. And then we will stand and sing together. Remember, we're here to worship our great God and give Him glory this morning. All right, good. Still plenty of seats over here in the front, over here in the front. If you're looking for a seat. All right, Psalm 29, 1 through 4, 9 through 11. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord above the vast water. The voice of the Lord in power. The voice of the Lord in splendor. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the woodlands bare. In His temple all cry, Glory! The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned, King forever. The Lord gives His people strength. The Lord blesses His people with peace. And that's the Lord we want to worship this morning together. Let's stand and sing unto Him.
Welcome, everybody. What a blessing to stand here in front of you to see how large our family is getting. This is so cool to see this church just busting at the seams. This is the house of the Lord, and we are his family. Let's open this day with the word of prayer. Father God, we invite you into this service this morning that you will anoint and bless every one of us, Lord God. And as our family grows, let's pray and remember this week a special prayer for Seth and Bailey Wentworth. Lord God, and Mark and Susie Wilson, Lord, bless them and let us remember them in prayer. Daniel and Teresa Wilson, bless them, Lord. And Chris Wilson, what a blessing he is to us and as we are a blessing to one another. Lord, thank you for this time together. As we raise our voices in your praise, thank you, Lord, for all you've given us and this place to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's read the scripture today out of 1 Thessalonians, starting in chapter 4. We do not want to inform, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not give at the rest at no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we say this to you, I word the Lord. We who are still alive in the Lord's coming will certainly not perceive those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ who rose first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together and in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words.
All right. Good morning again. Thank you for your good singing this morning as we worship our great God together. Hallelujah for what he has done for us. Just want to mention a couple of things before we get started here this morning. Uh, I want to thank you for many of you who have been, been involved in helping us with meals. Um, we know that the, the Craigs have gone through a pretty dramatic time having an emergency C-section and then having their baby taken to Salt Lake. And, uh, but the good news is he is greatly improved and we're encouraged. They were able to go down and spend some time with him and even hold him. Uh, so we praise the Lord for, for all that God's doing in their lives. And uh, Cindy Wright had her total knee replacement. Amazingly, they sent her home the same day, and she's, she's doing pretty well. So thank you for the encouragement you have been in many different ways to those folks. Uh, we're glad Matt's here today and even playing after he had his minor surgery this week. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of good things. Um, in regard to the baby shower for, the, for uh, Danny, that's postponed just until we figure out what's going to go on with little Jimmy. So just so you know, ladies, about that. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, Jim Chevaria's dad just passed away. So you might pray for Deb and uh, Jim. They actually just uh, made their way to Tucson on a little vacation. And then they got that news. So they're going to have to work all those logistics out. So pray for them if you would. Um, as you can see, you got some things going on here with the sound booth, and uh, we are in transition, working on some things, trying to improve some things. Uh, Randy and Don have been helping us with that. We appreciate them. Uh, you'll see more changes uh, going on as we go along. Hopefully, this is going to end up in that back corner, so it won't be a uh, distraction to folks sitting in this middle section as much. So just pray for that as we work towards trying to improve that so the live stream will be a little better quality, and uh, people that are watching that won't be as frustrated. Um, so thank you for all that are involved with that. A couple other things. Uh, business meeting right after this service. So if you can stay, especially members, for that, we appreciate it. Um, there's an a adult dinner that we're going to have on the last Saturday this month. And there's a sign-up sheet back there. We'd like you to sign up if you can. We'd love to have you come. It's just going to kind of be an informal kind of a, a dinner, a time when we can get together as a church family. Uh, be a few games or something with that. So nothing, no big formal thing, but we're going to have some good food. And uh, we're hoping to get some of the teens to help with that, serving us, and uh, so looking forward to that. So please sign up for that if you would. There's a card back there for Jim and Debbie as well if you want to sign that. Uh, just expressing your sympathy at this time for them. All right. I think we got all the details out of the way. All right. We're back in First Thessalonians this morning. If you want to turn there, First Thessalonians. We're going to finish up chapter 4 and go into chapter 5. Title this, Be Encouraged, because that's the theme here, Be Encouraged. God wants us to be encouraged, just as he wanted these folks to be encouraged, as Paul wrote this letter to the believers in Thessalonica. We have a tendency to be discouraged in this time of our existence here and the culture and all the things that are going on. And especially if we don't see the big picture, the big story, if you're not in Sunday school hour, Brian's doing a great job of pre presenting that to us so that we can have a proper perspective on what's going on all around us. But ultimately, we are to be in encouraged in many different ways, but specifically today, we're to be encouraged around and about the second coming of Jesus. It's interesting that the early church seemed to have been much more focused and they talked about it a lot more and they looked a lot more for the second coming than probably we do as the contemporary church. And it's very important that we get our focus on the second coming and what Jesus is Christ is planning and doing in our near, possibly the near future here. We're all encouraged by different things. Uh, this past week, out of the blue, I got this package from Amazon. And uh, in it was this kind of like trapper hat. You know, it had the fur on it and a thing to go across here. And it's going to be a perfect hat for skiing, you know, riding up that lift, keep you nice and warm. But the thing was, I didn't know where, where it came from. Who sent me this hat, you know? My wife didn't do it. I checked with my daughters. They didn't do it. It's like we were kind of stumped. Who, who would send me a random hat like that, you know? 
The Lord sent it to me, yes. But I did find out uh, a, a young man who was in our church in Thousand Oaks from Cameroon. Uh, we had we'd been involved in his life quite a bit. He's now living in Oklahoma. Just randomly decided, led by the Lord, I guess, to send me this hat. And just those little things, they encourage you, you know? I mean, it doesn't take a lot to be encouraged, does it? Just some little thing, like uh, a text to somebody who's going through something. When you text them or when you call them or when you take a meal, or all these little things encourage people. And we want to be encouraged as God's people. And God wants us to be encouraged. It's encouraging that uh, in a time when drag queen story time is being promoted in libraries, then we got Kirk Cameron with his new book, As You Grow, talking about fruit of the Spirit and things that happen in the Christian life, going around to libraries and doing his story and getting into, after, after putting out a request of 50 libraries around the country and being denied by many and ignored by others, finally he is now on tour and going to many of these, even some of those libraries that uh, rejected him or ignored him to begin with. That's encouraging. To somebody with a book that's got spiritual truth is able to go into the public library and tell the children about that. We can look all around us every day and see a lot of things that can be very encouraging in the midst of what's going on. And we want to focus on the encouraging things, not the discouraging things. If we just focus on the discouraging things, we'll be a, a very discouraged people, won't we? But God has not appointed us to discouragement. He's appointed us to encouragement. So let's pray and we'll continue. Father, as we look at this passage this morning, we're asking that you encourage our hearts just as you were encouraging the hearts of those who this letter was written to. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us with the hope of the second coming, with the hope that your son is going to return and that this isn't all there is and that all things will be righted and that there will be restoration someday. And Lord, we praise you for that. We thank you for that now in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus promised that though he was leaving, he was going to return and take his disciples where he was. Remember this verse, if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am you may be also. That early church was thinking about this regularly. This promise, Jesus did go away, but he's somewhere preparing a place for us. And where he is, he wants us to be. And he's going to come back, and he's going to get us, and he's going to take us to be with him. How exciting is that? It was especially exciting for the disciples who had lived with him for three years, knew him personally, and now they were experiencing this loss, and what do we do without Jesus? And thankfully, he sent his spirit to indwell them, to empower them, to give them confidence and boldness and courage. But man, what a hope to know that though he left, he's coming back. And he's got me on his mind, and he's preparing a place for me. Later, um, or yeah, a little later from this verse, when Jesus told them that, that they watched him ascend into heaven, and the angels said there, they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Why are you just looking into heaven now? Listen, you don't, you don't have to be discouraged and you don't have to be dis, dis, uh, disoriented by this because let me give you a promise. He's coming back the same way. He's coming back the same way. Now, in this book of 1 Thessalonians, it's interesting that 25% basically of the space given to this letter that Paul wrote is a reference to the second coming. We see it in every chapter. First, second, third chapters, there's a verse at the end. This whole paragraph here in chapter 4, whole beginning paragraphs of chapter 5, all about the second coming. Because the early church was all about looking for Jesus. Every day they got up and as they lived their life and, and as they worked through the temptations and had to persevere when the enemies were trying to discourage them, they had one hope, and that is that Jesus is coming back and that I'm going to go and be with him. Now, one of the three big questions, where did I come from, why am I here, and where am I going? The last question, where am I going, 
is all about the second coming. And God gives us great hope. Where am I going? There's three related verses that we look at this morning just for a partial picture of this. The one I just read, John 14, 3. It says the believers are going to have a forever home with Jesus. Where are we going? We're going to our forever home with Jesus. If you put your faith and trust in Christ alone, recognizing that you're a sinner, that you can't save yourself, it's not by works, it's only by what Christ has done on the cross, and you're in Christ, you're going to have a forever home with Jesus, John 14 tells us. 1 Corinthians 15, 15 through 51 through 52 says, we are going to have a forever body like Jesus. Not only a forever home, but a forever body. This body you're living in right now, it's fading, it's hurting, it's, it's not pleasant. Can't get out of bed in the morning. It's going away. Getting new bodies. And that's what this passage is about. Getting new bodies. It's about the resurrection. Forever home, forever body. And then right in here it talks about how we will be forever safe with our Lord Jesus. We will be with him forever. It says in, in verse 17 that we're going to be caught up together to meet in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, will, so we will always be with the Lord. Where are we going when this is all over? To our forever home and our forever body, forever with Jesus. That's what's going to take place. That's what the Bible is teaching us, and that's encouraging. That's really encouraging because what we have here, although it's, we're very blessed, falls far short. As we've been learning in Sunday school, we went from, from order to disorder, right, on this planet, and from good to not so good to evil. But all that's going to turn around when Jesus returns. So be encouraged. Be encouraged. We have a bright and solid future in Christ. You know, when someone's preparing a meal, maybe you like to cook, maybe someone else likes to cook in your house, and you, and you maybe enjoy the process of putting food together and mixing the recipes up and coming up with some delectable meal. Well, if you're the person on weight, it's, it's awesome that they're preparing the meal and going through that whole process, but what you really want is the food delivered, right? You're sitting there waiting, drooling maybe even, because you know how good your wife or your husband cooks, and you're like, all right, this is great, but let's not drag this thing out. Let's get to the food. And sometimes we feel like that with Jesus. It's like, okay, Lord, this is great that I'm here, and I, and, and I know you have a purpose for me, but <laughs> can we just get home? We want to go home. We want to be with you. Or the end of the trip. I mean, if you know, if I know my, let's say my son's coming home from Texas and I, and I know they're leaving and they're heading this way and they're bringing the grandkids and they're on the way and that's great news that they're on the way. That's good. But man, we just want them to get here, right? My wife wants to see Drew Boo. And I do too, of course. But I mean, these kids that we haven't seen, our grandkids, get here. We want them here. Yes, they're coming. We know that. And that's encouraging. And praise the Lord, we know Jesus is coming. But God, we, we just want to be with you. We want you to come. Please come. And so we pray for that day. We look forward to that day when we'll be with him. Now in this day, today in this passage, we've read the first part, 13 through 18 already. Let me read a few verses for you from chapter 5 because we're going to look at the end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 today. We're moving pretty quickly through this. About the times and seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. And when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in the dark, for this day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep like the rest, but let us stay awake and be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled and put on the armor of faith and love and a helmet of the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. And just as the passage in chapter 4 concludes, so the passage in chapter 5 concludes. Encourage 
one another. We're to be encouraging one another regularly, and how are we to do that? Well, in this particular passage, we are to encourage one another with the story of Christ's return. Looking forward. Yes, it's important to understand what happened in the past, but now we're to be looking forward, looking for Jesus, the one who came, lived the perfect life, and then died on the cross in our place, providing for a salvation, saving our souls, is going to come back, and he's going to give, give us our resurrection bodies. What a day that'll be. New bodies. New bodies to line up with the new soul that we have. So we got these chapters, 14 and 5, both parts. A couple things, observations. First of all, these two passages are talking about different events. Secondly, in light of that, we see that in the first case, chapter 4, the people were uninformed. We see in the second passage, in chapter 5, they were informed. In the first passage, it's addressing believers, whether dead or alive. In the second passage, it's addressing unbelievers and believers. In the first passage, we're talking about gathering of believers. And in the second passage, we're talking about who will face destruction and who won't. So there's different things going on in these two passages. As we said, the goal of these both passages is the same. The goal is to encourage believers. It's the building up of the faith. My wife and I are talking about how sometimes we're not as encouraging to one another as we should be. And then we both think of our mothers. My mother was my biggest fan. And my wife was talking about how much her mother was always an encouragement to her. Listen, we thrive on encouragement. So let's give it, right? If we thrive on encouragement so much, we should be giving it, giving it out. And Paul says, listen, I want you to encourage one another with these words. Encourage, encourage, encourage. These passages are very important because they tell us how to encourage one another. And it also tells us that the second coming of Jesus is important to meditate on, to think about, to look to for hope. So what encourages you? What encourages you in life? What is encouraging you today? Are you able to look past the temporal and find encouragement beyond that? Because 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, Do not focus on the seen but the unseen. Because the seen, the things we see are temporary, but the unseen is eternal. God is asking us to look through eyes of faith that something, at something that those without Christ can't see. They can't see it. But we can because the Spirit of God continues to illuminate us, to help us to understand, to see truth from the Word of God. And when it comes to the second coming of Christ, to understand that He has us in mind and He's coming back to get us. Now in the first passage, the main concern is those that are asleep those that have died. And dealing with the loss of loved ones is a real thing. And it's not an easy thing to deal with the loss of loved ones. Family members, close friends, when they pass away, they, they, live this, they leave this void in your life. Someone who you, especially someone who you've been very, very close to and maybe lived with on a daily basis and shared many memories with and, and all of a sudden, they've been taken out of your life. Right? It's, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to deal with. Paul's discussing the end of life here, and he's addressing real emotions and questions that are being asked about this. And again, all of this to give comfort and hope around these end-time questions. So look at the, let's look at the first passage here. He says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, concerning those who are asleep. In this first passage, he didn't want the believers to be uninformed about something that could bring them encouragement. They, he didn't want them grieving for these believers that had passed away as those who have no hope. Now, this passage is generally known as the rapture passage, and that's because of the word caught up, down in verse 17. It says they're going to be caught up together. That word caught up, means to seize, to pluck, to pull, to take by force even. And the Latin word is raptura, which is where we get the English word for rapture. The, rap, the word rapture is not here. 
but it is the word in the Latin for this word caught up, and so rapture is the word that's been used very often for this. Now, I understand there's a lot of baggage around the timing of the rapture, and we're not going to try to figure that out today. That's not the goal of this message. That's not the goal of this passage. But we see here that three times Paul talks about people that are asleep. Verse 13, he says, concerning those who are asleep. Verse 14, at the end of the passage, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Verse 15, at the end of the passage, we who are still alive, the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who are fallen asleep. What does that mean? Fallen asleep. Was there a bunch of people that were just laying around in bed sleeping all the time? Well, clearly, it's defined for us down in verse 16 when it's talking about the Lord himself will descend. And at the end, it says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Those that are asleep here, he's using that analogy for those who have died, for the dead. And sleeping here is also paralleled with Christ's death, and it was his historical death in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died physically on a cross and rose again in the same way through Jesus, he talks about here. So we, we know we're talking about physical death, and these people had died. They, they are, in this analogy, figuratively asleep, and that's appropriate because when, we, when our bodies die and go in the grave, it is temporal. When your loved one dies, their body, which is just a house they've been living in, it's a shell now, and it's put in a grave. But the real person, the soul and spirit of that person, has gone on to be with the Lord. But the good news is that that body is not going to stay in the grave forever, but it's coming back. It's going to be resurrected, and it's going to turn from corruption to incorruption and from mortal to immortal. Because God has a plan and a purpose for us to live in this body, although new for all eternity. These people that had fallen asleep were going to be awakened. Now, when I sleep, I don't know about you, but I'm generally unaware of what's going on around me. I mean, because I have an energetic wife, I end up going to bed before her usually. And uh, when she comes to bed, I don't hear a thing. I don't know if she came to bed or not. I just right through it. Now, occasionally, I will be awake when she comes to bed, and she comes in and, you know, gets ready for bed and does her thing. And I'm like, man, how can I sleep through this? Because when I'm awake, it's annoying. But when I'm sleeping, I don't hear a thing. <laughs> right? But I'm never worried that I won't wake up again. I'm never worried about that when I go to sleep. And then I'll be fully aware of what's going on again. And so it is with the physical death of the believer. Though our bodies will die and decompose and be placed in a grave, we have every reason to believe, based on what the Word of God tells us, that they will come back to life. While they're, while they're sleeping, they won't be aware of anything's going on, but they will hear something. And we see it in this passage. There's going to be a shout. There's going to be a command. And we're going to hear it. And we're going to come out of our graves if we're already dead. And it's going to be a day like none other. You remember the story of Lazarus, Jesus' friend, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Jesus gets word that Lazarus had died. He actually tells his disciples, Lazarus sleeps. He sleeps. They're like, so big deal. He's sleeping. So he finally has to tell him directly, no, he's dead. And we're going to go see him. But he waits a couple of days just to make sure there's no question about whether he's dead. And then they travel, and he's dead. In fact, he's been in the grave four days, and Martha says, he stinketh. But we know what Jesus did. He spoke. He commanded and Lazarus came out of the grave alive. Now, that was a temporary resurrection because he was still in the same body, just brought back to life, and he did die again. 
We're not talking about that kind of resurrection. We're talking about a resurrection where we're going to get a new body and we will never die. But he said, Lazarus sleeps, and Lazarus woke up. Now, technically, all human beings are going to be resurrected. You know that. Some to life and some to death. But Paul's point of encouragement here is that the bodies of these dead believers will be resurrected so that they can always be with the Lord. And somehow there was in the minds of these believers there in Thessalonica that there was going to be some disadvantage to the believers who had died before them. They're all, they're all in anticipation waiting for Jesus to return. I mean, they think it's going to happen in their lifetime. And they're discouraged because some of the believers, family, friends, people in their church, have died. It's like, are these guys going to miss out on this awesome experience of meeting Jesus in the clouds? Somehow, are they going to be disadvantaged? I don't know exactly what they were thinking, but they were, but they were concerned. And, they were, and their grief was not because they lost a loved one, because that's a natural grief, and we all grieve when we lose a loved one. But there was another kind of a grief there going on, a grief that somehow their loved ones were going to miss out on some of the joy that would come at the day of resurrection. Now, in that day, there was little hope in the pagan world. You died, and that was it. In fact, on a sepulcher in Thessalonica, a heathen sepulcher, it said, after death, there is no revival. And after the grave, no meeting of those who have loved each other on earth. So some of that thinking may have linked into the church thinking, and they're mixed, mixing that in. They're trying to sort it out. Like, what's going to happen? These guys have died. What's going to happen? We're waiting for Jesus. We know when he comes back, he's going to take us with us. But what about those that are already in the grave? Their body's dead. It's decomposing there. And Paul's addressing this. And he gives us this great hope. Not only are the souls of these believers already with the Lord, who had passed, but someday their bodies were going to be as well. Someday they were going to be united. So the issue here seems to center around the bodies of the dead in Christ and were they at some kind of disadvantage and, and uh, what was going to happen to them? Were they going to be forever floating around as spirits without bodies since they died before the coming of Jesus and this resurrection event? Or what's going, to go, what's going to happen? And Jesus is, I mean, Paul is bringing them hope here that they're not going to miss out. They're not going to miss out. So some vital information. Num number one, in this passage, we see that our hope is grounded in the gospel. Our hope is grounded in the gospel. What does it say? It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and was rose again. Okay, if we believe that, then we can believe that though we die, we are going to rise again. That's the gospel. Jesus' death and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 He's talking about our new resurrected bodies. He's talking about how if Christ hasn't been resurrected, our faith is in vain. He says in verse 17, And if Christ had not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If the resurrection isn't true. But in verse 20 he says, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. This is the fact that's can, been witnessed by many people, he says in the beginning of chapter 15. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. For each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, and after his, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. The resurrection. Jesus is the first fruit. You know what the first fruit is? You have a fruit tree, you get a couple of apples hanging there to begin with, all the rest are green yet, and those, these two ripen up, they're the first fruits. They're indication of what's coming, and you taste that first apple, like, man, this is awesome, I can't wait for the rest of these apples to ripen. Jesus was the first fruit. He's a picture of what's coming. Remember, he resurrected from the dead, he came back, the disciples were cowering in, their, in the room, the, the doors locked, and Jesus just appeared and essentially came through the door without opening it. And yet he took a piece of fish and bread and ate that, indicating that he was still physical, but in a new body. And that's coming for us. What a hope. 
we have. And it's grounded in the gospel. Just as Jesus Christ's death and resurrection ensures that we will have eternal life, it also ensures that though we die physically, we'll be resurrected bodily in Christ. So don't grieve. Don't grieve for them because they will actually return with Christ. It says in verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way, through Jesus, God will bring with him, with Jesus, those who have fallen asleep. They're with him. He's going to bring them back. He's bringing them back. Don't grieve for them. The best is yet to come. So we see here in this passage that living believers will not, rec- will not receive resurrected bodies before the dead in Christ do. Verse 15. For if we say this to you by the word of the Lord, you who are alive, you are still alive, okay, so the believer's still living, when the Lord returns, which could be us, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. So that was the big deal in that context that you are not going to have an advantage over them. Believers will not proceed, but the big news is the Lord himself. For the Lord himself, God himself, Jesus himself is coming back. He's coming back to get the believers and take them with him. He doesn't send another angel. He doesn't send some substitute. This is serious business. This is fulfilling a promise. He said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Christ's return is going to be accompanied by a loud shout or a loud command that the saints will respond to. Now listen, this isn't a secret or quiet thing. There's going to be a loud shout that's going to be heard. Now, whether this is, whether this is a, all describing one thing here, this shout, archangel, trump of God, like God's word is being spoken by an archangel and it's going to sound like a trump of God, or if these are three different parts of this event, it doesn't say. But it's going to be something that gets our attention and we're going to respond to what God says. It's kind of like a general speaking to his troops or a driver speaking to the horses, encouraging them to go, or a captain talking to the rowers. It's a command. It's authority. It's urgent. And when Christ returns, there will be no mistaking it. What did he say? Did I hear that right? Is this really the time to go? No. Instantaneously. When we hear that, there's going to be a catching up. And the bodies of the dead will rise first, it says. Then we who are alive... I mean, let's see. And the dead in Christ will rise first, verse 16, and then 17. Then we who are still alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. The bodies of the dead will rise out of the grave first, but all believers will be caught up together into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, never to be separated from him again. So be encouraged. Be encouraged because... There is going to be an end of the journey. There's going to be an end of the gap when Christ will return and will he, when he will show up and when we will meet him. We have not seen him face to face yet. The disciples had. So they have memories like, wow, we get to be with him again and really soon here. But we haven't met him face to face, but on this particular moment, we will see Jesus face to face. And we'll have our new bodies and we'll be able to appreciate it on a level beyond what we can even imagine now. It's going to be a glorious day. So he says, be encouraged. Be encouraged because you will always be with the Lord from this point out. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That's coming. That's our hope as believers. Christ is coming back. Whether you're in the grave or whether you're still living, you will be caught up to meet him in the air. And we'll see him face to face. Our loving Savior who died in our place, paid the price for our sin, gave us freely his righteousness so that we could dwell with him for all eternity. All right, second passage. This passage, they were, they were informed. He says, I don't need to write anything to you because you yourselves know very well about this topic. Apparently, this was the topic that Paul talked about quite frequently. 
And even in a short period of time, as you remember, he wasn't long with this church at Thessalonica. Just a very brief time, but apparently he had talked about this a lot because they already knew about it. Shame on us for not talking about it more. So he's talking about the day of the Lord. What is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord generally is talking about the judgment of God. And it starts with the tribulation period. Some things we see about this day of the Lord in this passage. The first thing is it's going to come, verse 2, like a thief in the night. It's not announced with a shout like the event in the former passage. It comes at a time when people, and in this context, they say peace and security. So they, referring to unbelievers at that time, are going to believe that, that everything's good. We got peace, we got security, there's nothing to worry about. All this talk about, you know, future things happening, we're good. It's going to bring sudden destruction, it says, like labor pains of a woman. Generally, that talks about a period of time, right? Labor pains. <laughs> and depending on the individual woman, that can vary. And depending on how much drugs they take, right? But if you were going to do this thing natural, like my wife did for all four of our kids, she knows what this labor is all about. And I'm not saying any, any women don't know about what it is about because I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know it's a period of time. Right? She goes into labor, and she goes through labor. There's this period of time coming on, and, and he's coming back, and there's going to be some destruction, but it's going to go on like the labor pains of a pregnant woman. And finally, it says, they will not escape. They can't escape it. Now, sometimes we think, well, why doesn't God just zap those people? Or why doesn't God do away with evil? And why doesn't God bring revenge? Man, I just want to see that because it's going to happen, folks. It's coming. And if you want an even more vivid picture, read the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians because it gets very vivid. So these are things we see here that are characteristics of this. And in addition, we see through this passage, and we don't have time to look at all this today, but as you read this passage, you'll see different pronouns used. There's the they, those, referring to the unbelievers, and there's the U.S. referring to the believers. There's a the clear distinction in this passage between those who are going to be getting destroyed and those who aren't. And then we see some other contrasts. Dark and light, night and day, sleep and awake, drunk and self-control. Down through this passage, these are used figuratively to describe the condition of these people, whether unbelievers or believers. And some, they says the unbelievers, as we just saw, are going to face sudden destruction like the labor pains of a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. There's an urgency here, folks. There's an urgency because when Jesus returns, those without Christ are going to face this. That's their destiny. So the unbelievers are pictured here as being in the dark or in the night. They're sleeping and they're drunk, meaning they are unaware and uninformed because they have rejected the truth is the primary reason. And they are asleep to reality. And they are out of control morally. There's a whole, and yet they think it's fine and they think that they can continue this and it's always just going to be okay. God says, no, it's not going to be okay. The believers, on the other hand, the us, the you and the us, are pictured as being aware, they're informed, they're alert, they're under control. They're not caught off guard or surprised. And since they are children of the day, they have the ability to be self-controlled and to put on their armor, which is called here faith, love, and hope of salvation. So what's the comfort in this passage? The last passage, the comfort was, listen, this isn't it. You die, that's not it. Christ is returning. And when he returns, we're going to be caught up and get new bodies and meet him in the air and see him face to face and be with him forever. And the encouragement in this passage is simply this, that if you're in Christ, you are going to escape an eternity of wrath. An eternity of wrath and possibly something even more immediate here in this passage. 
because it says very clearly in verse 9, for God did not appoint us. That pronoun is talking to us as believers. God did not appoint us, believers, to wrath. But he appointed us to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He rescued us from the wrath of God. A just God pouring out his wrath on those who have rejected him and started rejecting him way back in the beginning in the, in the garden where they, self, they, they chose to be autonomous. They chose to do their own thing. They chose to have their own rules. They said, I don't want to do it your way. And God says, okay. Then here's the consequence to that. But for you that have said, I want to follow Jesus, even though, as Brian pointed out this morning, we're far from perfect. It's not about us. It's about what Christ did for us, for us that are, for us that are in Christ. The good news is, the comforting word is, that we're going to be saved from this destruction, from this wrath. He didn't appoint us to wrath. Now, no doubt this is talking about external damnation, external, eternal, excuse me, condemnation from from a God who must punish sin. And possibly, I, it could even indicate that we're going to be, and this is where some of the debate is about the return of Christ. And what's so frustrating to me about the debates that are out there, and, and we're not having those kind of situations here, but there are, there are discussions about the, tri- the, uh, the rapture, and if it's before the tribulation, after the tribulation, right? And good men are, I believe, in both ways, both sides of that. What frustrates me about that debate or discussion is that I think it has caused us to back away from the hope of the second coming, right? Well, since that can get a little, you know, uh, people can get a little edgy about that or a little upset about the timing of when this is going to happen, let's just back off from it. No, we can't back off from it. It's It's the center of hope. It's the center of encouragement, whether we are saved from the tribulation period and all the wrath or whether we're saved from all the wrath, whichever it is, folks, our encouragement is in the fact that Jesus died on the cross to save us from the penalty of our sin and from this wrath that's going to come on and destroy mankind because they've rejected him. We've been saved from that. If you're saved this morning, it's because God called you, brought you out of that miry pit, gave you something you could never earn on your own, his righteousness. So that when you stand before God someday, you will be able to stand there boldly and with confidence, not because of what you've done, but because of what Jesus did. And all those who have rejected Jesus as their personal Savior are going to be faced with sudden destruction. It's sobering. It's very sobering. So Paul's main message here this morning is be encouraged. Be encouraged. Why? Because your body will be resurrected and glorified at Christ's return, completing the new creation. And you'll be able to enjoy a complete redemption and restoration, and you'll dwell in God's presence for all eternity, just like it was supposed to be from the beginning. It's all going to be changed and fixed in the end. And you don't have to fear the wrath of God because you've been saved from that. If you're in Jesus today, because he died for you, whether you are alive when he comes back, Asleep, you will be saved, and you will live together with him forever. That's our hope. That's our encouragement. Can I get by the fender bender today? Yeah, I can. Can I get by that I'm a little sick today? Yeah, I can. Why? Because I know what the future holds. I'm going to get a new body. I won't need a car. Right? We'll all get along because Jesus is going to change us and give us a resurrected body. What a day that'll be. Father, thank you this morning for your word. We pray especially for anyone sitting here this morning under the sound of my voice who has never come to that point in their lives where they've admitted that they are a sinner in danger of eternal wrath and who has admitted that they cannot in and of themselves ever please a holy God and they've never turned to your son Jesus and put their faith and trust in him 
for salvation. Lord, if there's someone like that this morning here, I pray that you and you alone through your spirit would convict them and draw them and help them to understand the encouragement that comes from Jesus and what he's done for us. And Lord, help us as believers this morning as we, as we go through life, as, as we go through the everyday routine, the rat race, so to speak. Lord, may we lift our eyes up from what we are facing here to see what the future hope is. And Lord, to realize that even though our outer man is deteriorating, our inner man is being encouraged and growing every day, and, and we look forward to those things that are unseen, because the things that are seen are not so good, but the things that are unseen are going to be great because we will be with you forever. And we thank you for that today. We pray you encourage our hearts together in Jesus' name.